Hello everybody and welcome to this session um, brought to you by the Australian American Fulbright Commission. My name is Dr Ruth Lee Martin and at the moment I'm the Acting Executive Director of the Commission. I have with me today Dr Pablo Jimenez and I think he's just disappeared for two minutes um, out the door. I'm sure he'll be back in a sec. So today I'm bringing you a targeted um, presentation. This is going to be targeted at professional scholarships and seniors. And we also have one distinguished chair in there as well. So I'm going to go through the presentation fairly quickly and, um, and then Pablo is going to take over and we have some wonderful alumni here today and they're going to give their testimony about what it was like for them to have a, a Fulbright and then you'll also get to ask some questions at the end. So, um, so let's get cracking the, on the, for the presentations on professional and senior scholarships. Okay, so what is our mission? Our mission is to promote cultural and educational exchange between the US and Australia. The bi-national treaty is very, very important to us and um, we follow in Senator Fulbright's uh, path when he, first of all, decided that a way forward for the world would be for people to live in peace and harmony, not forgetting that he was coming out of the uh, World War II. So he felt that a really good way to do this was by educational and cultural exchange that would lead to mutual understanding between peoples and he felt that mutual understanding would thereby lead to people living in peace and harmony. Our vision for ourselves is no small one and that is to be the leading scholarship body between the US and Australia. And I think we are indeed a, a commission uh, known for its excellence and uh, the high quality and rigour of our scholarships and the selection process. We're also very much known, I think, uh, for our networks and our collaborations, which go on um, far beyond the short time of the Fulbright program. And in fact, I, I've started telling people that the Fulbright scholarship really is the start of your Fulbright experience and hopefully it goes on for long after the three or four months if you're a professional or senior scholarship scholar and that the collaborations go on for years to come. So as I said, it was first of all proposed by Senator Fulbright um, with the largest uh, educational uh, exchange program in the world and we go over 160 countries now and we have indeed exchanged over 300,000 scholars between the US and a whole bunch of other countries. So we were indeed established by a treaty. It was one of the earliest treaties between the US government and the Australian government. And uh, you'll be interested to know a little bit of Fulbright um, uh, facts here is that the very first Australian scholarships were funded from the sale of war armaments. So indeed that very direct, um, you know, changing things, selling these, these instruments of war and destruction and turning them into um, a very powerful um, path forward for peace. Uh, we have as our uh, co-chairs the Prime Minister of Australia and of course the US Ambassador. And underneath the two uh, honorary co-chairs are a board of 10 members, five Australian and five from the US. And um, we have exchanged I think over 2,700 or oh, well, 5,000 all up, 2,700 um, Australians have gone to the US and over 2,000 Americans have come here. And there's the signing of the Fulbright Agreement in that little photo there. 
Okay, so Fulbright values. I think these are really important to think about when you're uh, considering putting in an application because you really need to understand what the people on the panel will be looking for. And they're looking for these Fulbright values. We want passion. We're looking for passionate people, people that are driven to excel in their field, to push boundaries and move, move, dr move and drive forward. Uh, we're looking for that passion to come through, not only in the written application, but if you're fortunate enough to be shortlisted, we certainly want to see plenty of passion, that same passion for your field in the interview process. We want to see people who have a vision for themselves and uh, how they sit within their field, what they can bring to their field. So you'll find as my talk goes on that Fulbright is more about giving to others than it is about receiving. And that's a little bit of Fulbright gold that I've given you there if you're putting in an application. Fulbright is about giving perhaps even more than it is about receiving. We want demonstrated excellence. It could be excellence in your field, in your academic work, but it could be outside of that too. We, I always say at Fulbright, we're rather greedy. We're rather greedy people. We want it all. We don't just want people with an excellent record in their academic field, but we're looking for really wonderful all-rounders as well. And here you might have done some excellence in other things. You might have been a volunteer for the Red Cross for the last five or six years, or you might have taken a local choir and been working with some, some kids there, or you might have been coaching a football team or something and there's been some kind of recognition. So that kind of all-rounded uh, all person is something that we're particularly interested in. We're looking for people who have innovative ideas, the ability to look and think outside the box, to push the boundaries forward for, for themselves and for their field, and to bring others along with them. That is very, very important for Fulbright. Oh, so one very important thing here, another bit of Fulbright gold, we're looking for people with the potential to form long-term partnerships and collaborations, linkages that will go on well beyond the length of the scholarship and will continue even sometimes, I've heard, 20 years uh, later, uh, those same collaborations are still continuing. That gives us a lot of bang for our buck. We love that. And perhaps this, is the, this last point is where Fulbright may differ from other scholarship bodies. We are looking for people also with ambassadorial skills. We're looking for people who have a sense of diplomacy, who will ably um, be able to represent the Fulbright Commission and also the US and the Australian governments. And here we have um, a list of the scholar benefits. So you can see that we offer a monthly stipend and it is paid to our scholars monthly. We offer uh, travel, international travel, one return flight to the US and back. Some ASPE insurance, which is valued at up to $100,000. Um, I think, and again, perhaps one of the most important things about Fulbright is its incredible network. And we have a network very well established, both in Australia and in the US. Uh, Fulbright is really, really well known in the US, perhaps more so in Australia, although we are working on that. Um, but something to keep in mind is that you will get access to alumni um, and others involved in the Fulbright community, the Fulbright family. We have a wonderful orientation program um, which goes in, I think it'll be in March next year, early March, um, and that is a three-day program where we bring all our new scholars in. There's usually about um, 30 from Australia and about 22 or so from America, about 52 all up. They go into lockdown for a three-day program and we uh, have lots of things, activities for them, but also it's a chance for them to build their networks and we introduce them to a variety of people uh, during their, their orientation. 
Also, the other thing we have is a scholar showcase, and I think it's a little bit different, again, perhaps than what other people might do, because every scholar from the postgrads to the distinguished chair do a Fulbright poster. And it's like a cocktail session on steroids, if you like. So um, you get to wander around with a, a nice glass of something bubbly, and you get to really engage the scholars on their projects. We found the posters are amazing because they really are a great entree into talking to people about an area that you may not know about. So um, we also, after that, have a presentation dinner and we have many dignitaries uh, come to that and then the new Fulbrighters are awarded their certificate. So they're also up there is the value of the professional scholarship. You can see it's valued at up to 31,000 Australian dollars. And there's up to two of those available within the general category. And that means they can go across any discipline um, at all. And there's three senior scholarships available, uh, valued at up to $32,000 Australian. And they too are available across any discipline at all. It could be from the sciences or the creative arts. It won't matter if you can put in a good application and make a good case for your project, you can be selected. <clears throat> the rates for the amounts for the sponsored scholarships all vary according to the, the scholarship. So we have um, state scholarships. Um, these, the one for Victoria though, is only relevant for postgrads and postdocs. But in every state and territory, we do have state-sponsored scholarships. We have a Fulbright Indigenous scholarship, and this one goes across four categories. So if you know somebody uh, in, who's in, an Indigenous person working in some incredible area of research, tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, did you know that Fulbright have an Indigenous scholarship? It goes across post-grad, post-doc, professional or senior categories. That one is sponsored by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. We have a scholarship in Australia-United States Alliance studies and um, this scholarship is sponsored by DFAT and if, if you know anybody or if you yourself are working in the area, some area um, of the Alliance, the US-Australian Alliance, this is a wonderful scholarship to think about. And that one's valued up to 31,000 Australian dollars. We have the VET scholarship and that's for anybody who's working in the VET area. And um, what they're looking for for that scholarship is not so much, say, somebody who's doing academic theoretical study. They're looking for somebody who's um, doing research and study with a very practical application. And it should be of something, an area which really benefits the current strategy of, of VET. So just bear in, that in mind if you're interested in that. And that one's valued up to 31,000 Australian dollars and sponsored by the Department of Education and Training. We have the Coral Sea Scholarship in Business and Industry. The business industry linkage is fairly vague, really. So, but we're looking for something with some uh, kind of business or industry link, but it doesn't mean to say that it has to be um, entirely commercial. It might could be something like film studies that, that has a, an industry link. So something that has that, that link, but not necessarily, don't think so much commercially. Um, so the benefits of that scholarship too are up to 31,000 Australian dollars. We've got a, a scholarship in non-profit leadership. So for those in the non, working in the non-profit world, this is an ideal opportunity to put in an application. And um, at this year we have Hishem de Mortier uh, as one of our scholars. He's from the Northern Territory. And um, you'll, if you um, want to read more about him, we've got some information on him in the scholar booklets or up on our website. Again, the benefits are the same, $31,000 Australian. And this one's sponsored by the Origin Foundation and the Australian Scholarships Foundation. 
We have uh, a couple of scholarships that are sponsored by Kansas State University, the first US university to sponsor um, Fulbright in Australia. So the two scholarships are a distinguished chair in agriculture and life sciences. So again, if you're in that area of life sciences or agriculture, uh, and you're working at a very, very high level, you might be um, thinking about putting in an application. They also have a senior scholarship that is available to any discipline. So there is our scholar this year is Professor Ruth Wallace, again from the Northern Territory. They did really, really well this year in the uh, scholarships that were awarded. And um, this is a little bit different than the other ones. It's a generous uh, stipend for a six month program rather than three to four months of the professional scholarship. There's also accommodation provided with this scholarship and if you're selected for it, you'd also do a four centre tour of different places in America doing public talks. Um, the idea is to link up with uh, faculty at K-State University in the same field that you're working with to communicate and collaborate with them. And so you actually, it's like um, leaving Australia and going and just kind of being plonked down into a university where everything's set up for you. Colleagues are waiting for you to work with you, accommodations there, your stipend and living allowance. So what an amazing support that you get for this scholarship and you get the, the wonderful opportunity to work with the people from K-State and they're truly amazing people. They also went a little bit further than just sponsoring the one scholarship. They thought Gee, it'd be great to also have a senior scholar and this can be across any discipline. So if you're a senior scholar looking for a chance to collaborate with Kansas State University, an American university, um, this might be a great opportunity. Again, the faculty in your field will be waiting to work with you to think of a, an exciting project that you can do for the time that you're there. It's a six month duration. These scholarships are a little bit longer again than the other ones and um, an amazing opportunity. They're so friendly and welcoming at K-State. A great opportunity just to slip into uh, doing a research project that can be a little bit, you know, um, out of the box. I think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity for a senior academic. And this one is valued at up to 54,000 uh, Australian dollars. They also have another initiative, which is a wonderful play on words, called the Oz to Oz initiative. And um, what they're doing is all of our senior scholars and our professional scholars that go over to the US while they're in the US, Kansas State tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, how about coming down to Kansas State, sharing some of your expert expertise and <clears throat> working with our faculty and maybe giving some seminars, masterclasses and so forth, and they get to do a two week stint down there. They're paid an honorarium and they're, um, they're given um, uh, their flights are booked and everything. So it's a wonderful opportunity for a short term appointment at K-State. So some important things, what are we looking for? What are the select selection criteria of applying for a Fulbright scholarship? Well, yes, we are looking for academic and professional excellence, as I said before, in a very broad way. The relevance of the proposed program, I think, you know, at this level, you just, you, you must have so much experience in doing um, research proposals and so forth, and knowing that they need to be kind of doable, manageable within the time frame. It's very short, the time goes quickly, so don't put in a project that looks like it could take two years when you've only got uh, three or four months. Again, the potential outcomes that opportunity for making collaborations and linkages and things that go on well past the time of the scholarship, very important. That's something that the selection committee will be considering. We are open to Australian citizens only for the Australian awards. Um, and if you hold dual citizenship between the US and Australia, that makes you ineligible. 
It's just that we think, look, if you've already got the contacts in the US, you don't need us and our money is so precious because there's so many people it could go to. There's so much high quality, so many high quality projects that come past us that our big sorrow is that we can't fund more. So if you've already got linkages, we'll probably go, no, you don't really need Fulbright, you can do it on your own. And that's the reason for that. The wonderful thing about Fulbright, especially if you are a senior scholar, is that there's no age limit. Isn't that fantastic? So it doesn't matter. If you can pass the medical, um, you can get yourself to the US and you're eligible for, for a Fulbright. So we don't discriminate on any level for any reason. Gender, um, race, whatever, religion, anything, we are absolutely 100% um, behind that. You also must be a resident working in Australia at the time of application. And again, the reason for that is that we want to see a commitment to Australia. We don't want to fund you with um, Australian government funding and for you to go off and make your own way in Australia and not come back. We're very greedy, as I said before. We want it all and we want all that wonderful knowledge that our scholars have acquired to come back and benefit the Australian community. That's very important to us. And in fact, I should just make a, a little interlude here that the, uh, one of the conditions of the J-1 visa is that you do come back and do a two-year home residency in Australia. Um, it doesn't mean to say you can't go to the US for conferences and so forth and collaborations and stuff, but you need to be based in Australia and give benefits back to your local community. Okay, so I've spoken about the project proposal, but there's something else which some people find very difficult, and that is a personal statement. So we ask that you write about a page on who you are. And it is it can be a bit confronting, but we want, again, to know about you, the person. We know about your academic record. We can see that in the, in the um, things that, the papers that you provide us. But who are you as a person? We're really interested to know that. What kinds of things have you done in your life? Have you overcome hardships or have you been particularly community, community minded? Those kinds of things should go in this personal statement. You have three confidential reports, referee reports. So when you go online and put in all your information, they will ask you for the names of your referees and you'll put the names in with their contact detail and a form will be automatically generated and sent off to your referees and it comes straight back into the system. So bear in mind that you will not see that. At uh, professional and senior scholar level, we do want to see a host letter. The host letter is really important because it allows us to see, again, we're looking for this, what are the potential outcomes here? If we get a host letter that says, oh yes, I can give Dr. So-and-so a desk and a chair, we might go, hmm, that's all right. But somebody else might have a host letter that says, we're so excited to have Dr. So-and-so here. Um, we're providing with some, you know, space, desk and a chair, but in addition, we're really looking forward to having her uh, interact with our faculty and our department in, in myriad ways, uh, giving some seminars and presentations and things. So we want to see the connection is already there, ready to go as soon as the US um, uh, as soon as the scholar hits the ground running in the US. So that's really important to make sure that you get a really good host letter. And of course, make sure your application is submitted on time and click the submit button. It does happen occasionally that somebody might forget to do that. And then unfortunately, it just goes in the ether and we can't access it. So to be aware of that. Wonderful um, photo from one of our scholars, Justin Hartley, in a very cold US winter. Uh, there he is at Harvard. So um, there's a timeline. 1st of May, scholarships have opened already, and we're uh, moving now to the 1st of August when they will close. There will be no late applications accepted. Uh, in August, we do a technical review 
and then we send, start divvying all the applications up into their various categories and we send them out to our various um, selection panels, of which we have for Australia 13. So quite, uh, quite a task. They go out and then our poor selection committee members, I feel so ashamed every day when I send out these, <laughs> these um, emails saying, look, your applications are now ready, but the time is very short turnaround and they do an amazing job very, very thorough job um, and very rigorous. They're looking, they have criteria that they're marking against. It's all blind marked. Nobody knows what the others are marking. The marks come back into the commission. We collate them and we make a short list and then we ring the chair of the panel and we work out how many people we can put forward to interview. So that takes place in August and September, by mid-September, we're starting the interviews. And then by October, by mid-October, we kind of finished and get final endorsements. And then all the selections have to be sent to the US for selection by the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. So it's a lengthy process and um, we don't get the green light to let people know until December, early December. And that's very hard, but there's no point calling the Commission before then because there's nothing we can do. We've done our job. It's all waiting now with the State Department to be signed off. <clears throat> Um, and then you have to take your scholarship up between June 2017 and July, uh, July, sorry, July 2017 and June 2018. That's the scholarship year. Um, we do have, this is a little bit now of an aside, it, we do have a Fulbright Specialist Grant Program. So if you want the opportunity to bring in a senior specialist from the US, you can apply to this program. It's an institutional grant, so it goes to your university and it just brings over uh, a scholar maybe in the US um, to share and build capacity at your university. So just to put that at the back of your minds and uh, remember that if you're looking for a way to bring so over somebody who's fabulous in the US, there is this special grant that you can apply for. And uh, you contact Pablo over there and uh, he can tell you all about it. So that's about it for me. Um, there's our contact. Uh, we absolutely welcome uh, questions and queries. All we ask is that the, the applicants or potential applicants do their homework first and that is just have a look at the website and read very carefully our FAQs and once that has been done we're really really happy to take some additional questions that might pertain to your particular circumstance and at the end of this session I will indeed be handing out my card so that you can contact me but now I'm going to welcome up to the stage Dr. Pablo Jimenez, and he is going to facilitate an alumni panel, and we're going to get the alumni up now to give their testimony. So over to you, Pablo. Um, so we have, um, you have seen already the presentation, but we have uh, two living examples here of, of uh, someone who has already done this experience, and we always find it very, um, the audience finds it very useful to, to have someone telling you what they have already done. So my, um, I'll be um, making some questions to them, uh, to Karen and Hilton, and, um, and, and so we'll make a short question and short answer. Uh, the first question is, uh, could you please tell us, um, uh, Karen, what is your relationship with Fulbright, and, and a little bit of who you are? Uh, so, my name's Carolyn Evans. And Sorry, it's been streamed, so we need to... All right. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Uh, my name's Carolyn Evans. I'm now the Dean at the Law School here at Melbourne, and uh, when I received the Fulbright Senior Scholarship in to, uh, to study in 2010, I was also a member of the Law School. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to the United States, Washington, D.C., American University, uh, for a couple of months and then a couple of months to the Centre for Law and Religion Studies at... At Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, wonderful experience. Uh, and I was, in fact, appointed to the deanship um, during that time. So it, it, the experience changed a little bit because I was still pursuing the project 
on religious freedom, comparative religious freedom that I was undertaking, but there was also a great opportunity to start building institutional relationships between Melbourne Law School and some of the US institutions. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Hilton Menz. I'm a NHMIC research fellow at La Trobe University, uh, and I was a senior uh, fellow back in 2011, where I spent uh, five months in the US in total at Harvard University in the Institute for Aging Research. So my research area is musculoskeletal disorders. Um, so I was working on a very large epidemiology data set uh, that they hold at uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, so since I've done that, uh, we've maintained that collaboration and so we still have monthly teleconferences. So it's been a really uh, valuable experience uh, for me uh, in terms of setting up a really strong international collaboration, which continues to this day. Thank you very much. Caroline, can you tell us, um, as a woman, uh, was there anything special, anything, any particular difficulty you found in the process and also in your time over there? Is it, is it more difficult for women or is it the same? Do you have the same opportunity uh, to get a scholarship and to do this experience? Uh, I, I didn't experience any particular difficulties. I, I suppose what, what the selection panel thought or did is, is a matter entirely for them, but obviously I was successful as were a number of other women. And, I didn't. I certainly didn't experience any problems or issues. I had a husband and two kids, and I think that applies for many people. Now you've got to try and work out a program that works not just for you, but for a wider number of people. But these days, I don't think that's just an issue for women. It's, it can be a problem more generally. Thank you very much. We are very interested in, in promoting um, women in, also in senior positions to apply for Fulbright and sometimes this particular opportunity helps you to, to give a, a jump to the next step in, in your academic career, so it's, it's important. Uh, Hilton, could you tell us uh, if you're, you remember one or two people that were um, particularly interesting to you during your time in, in, in the US? Um, well, the, the main sort of contact that I had over there was, was uh, an epidemiologist who worked at the Institute for Aging Research. And um, uh, the way it worked out, my actual background, my first degree is podiatry, so I'm very interested in feet. Um, and she'd done all this research related to knee disorders um, and was just starting to find out from people who were coming in for this knee study that they had more problems with their feet than they had with their knees. So it was just perfect timing because she was about to embark on all this foot research and I sort of came along with all this foot interest. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in that sort of area of research that they hadn't touched on before. Um, and during the time there, I also managed to... Um, uh, liaise with uh, some statisticians there and picked up a lot of um, sort of statistical skills that I wouldn't have been able to access otherwise. So uh, those two people, the, the main host um, researcher but also the statistician, um, have now become you know, very, very close friends of mine and they've probably had the biggest impact on, on the research that we're doing from that uh, period onwards. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen, what, uh, could, could you tell us something that was added to your, uh, to what you already knew in your own career by going to the US? Was something that you got out of it, maybe just one or two things that you can think of? I mean, intellectually, it was a very rich experience. And one of the things I like to try and do uh, when I travel is sit in on classes for people who are particularly good teachers. So it's always interesting to look at the way that teaching is done differently in different countries, as well as working on research. Uh, perhaps an unexpected bonus was uh, when I discovered that I, I was going to be the next dean. Uh, I talked to a number of the US deans about fundraising, which they are vastly better at uh, than we are in Australia. Uh, and I had an interesting dinner where um, we, we worked on the pitch with a couple of very experienced and people and somebody pulled a, a dollar note out and said, there you go, you raised your first dollar. I was, I was so convinced. Um, so that, that was sort of one of those things that you can't always plan for in these experiences, but was really wonderful. And, and a lot of senior leaders, particularly a lot of senior women in the US were, were very happy to be encouraging and supportive and to give advice about that next career step. Uh, Hildon, um, Australia and the US seem to be very similar countries, maybe same size, and, and could you tell us some of the difference that you weren't expecting when you go to the US? Um, yeah, I think it's true that, that Australia and the US are very similar, but I also have a lot of um, links in the UK, and I'd probably say that 
uh, we probably have stronger cultural connections to the UK than the US in some ways. Um, and I think uh, some of the, the sort of cultural things, not that you want to make broad cultural generalisations here, but the Australian sense of humour obviously connects sometimes, but other times doesn't connect that well. Um, and the whole sort of cliche around you know, the, the uh, misunderstanding of irony and that sort of thing certainly played out in, in my situation. So I did have to modify my sense of humour a little bit. Um, and then we actually had uh, very young kids when we went. So we had a two-year-old and a 10-week-old, which was challenging. Um, and some of the, those issues around childcare um, were, were interesting. And um, also the issue with public breastfeeding was, was something that really... Um, struck home to us because my wife um, was used to breastfeeding in public and even in a city like Boston which you would imagine to be pretty progressive we did have some issues there which surprised me a little yeah but they, they could be uh, dealt with but some um, yeah there were some things that you think every now and then there's a little bit more of a disconnect than you might expect yeah okay so this is a very good introduction for the next question for Caroline um, you already both mentioned that you went with family. So what, what, were, what are the issues that you have to take into account uh, once you are there or, or before going uh, in terms of your family, the, the ones going with you? Yeah, in some ways, that they are the most complex issues. And it began even just with a negotiation. I probably would have spent all of my time at Emory um, if I'd been going by myself, just because intellectually that was the best place for me. But my family weren't that excited about spending four months in Atlanta. I'm really sorry this is being recorded. Um, and, but I have to say, I did somewhat sympathise after spending two months in Atlanta. Um, University is fantastic, but it's, it's not as intellectually and culturally rich. Uh, and we had kids who were in primary school, eight and nine years old. So somewhere like Washington, where you could go to the Smithsonian Museums and so forth was great. We made the decision to just pull our kids out of school for that period. And my husband homeschooled them. He took a sabbatical of his own effectively uh, and he could spend the morning doing maths and writing and then you could spend the afternoon going to a great museum or gallery or congress or somewhere like that. It was just a fantastic experience for the kids and they look back on it very happily. Uh, I think it's difficult because it's a relatively short period of time to get your kids into a school uh, or to do those sorts of things. But then, you know, it depends if you've got somebody else who can help with them over that period of time as well. If you if you haven't, that can be problematic. So I suppose the main thing I'd say is plan early, uh, but that the opportunities which are there are fantastic. And our, our kids look back on that as a really happy time in their lives. And our family, in some ways, got to spend more time together when we were in the US. Um, we Every weekend, we'd try and travel somewhere. I think we, by the time we came home, we'd seen 17 different states, which is more than most Americans. So, uh, you know, I think it can be a great experience, but it does plan over a very long period of time. So it's, as soon as you win, start thinking about how you're going to deal with, um, with things for kids because they aren't necessarily straightforward. And the amount of time that you've got is not an entirely uh, easy period of time. But I'd certainly say, hey, having your husband homeschool them is a really great option for those who might have that option. Okay, we have one more question for Hilton and then a last question for both of them and then we go to open questions. So Hilton, one day you might have been uh, in a room like this um, thinking about applying. Uh, how do you find about Fulbright and what made you apply? What, what moved you to actually apply? Um, well, I'd heard about Fulbright um, quite a long time ago, and it is one of those fairly well-known, fairly prestigious um, sort of things. So you, you hear about it a lot. Um, the main reason I decided to, to go ahead with it was that um, there was a real need within my area of research to do some fairly large-scale epidemiology research, which is very hard to do in Australia. It's hard to get the numbers. Um, and the research that was getting done at Harvard, they already had that data there, so they had a very large data set. So it was just a case of, OK, I, I really need data. They have the data, but they really need some analytical sort of expertise. So it was a win-win sort of situation. Um, and actually, the person who I ended up working with, I'd never met before. It was just done through email contact, and we were aware of each other just through publications and things. Um, so the, the Fulbright was a perfect opportunity to, uh, to, to get over there um, because most of my other collaborators were in um, the UK or in Europe. I didn't really have any strong links with the US. Um, but now, having done that, um, we do have this, this very, very strong connection. Um, so the Fulbright thing, I, it's, got a, it's got a lot of... Um, uh, sort of value to it. I mean, when you're in the US, and like you were saying before, I think it's it's probably uh, higher profile in the US than it is here. 
Um, it does certainly open doors when you get over there and you get introduced as a Fulbright Fellow. It, it is really quite a big thing, so it's a great program. Okay, so uh, we're going to closing uh, remarks. So in one minute, could you, uh, Caroline and, um, and Hilton, each of you, tell in one minute one piece of advice for the audience. If you could tell them just one thing that is the most important thing, if they are thinking about this possibility, what would you tell them? Well, for me, the really great thing about the Fulbright and being able to spend time in the US uh, was about making connections with people uh, and having those opportunities. For a lot of my research, I probably could have sat in my office and done you know, much of that research, but I wouldn't have had a chance to you know, sit down over breakfasts and coffees and uh, at seminars and present lectures that gave me a chance to really interact and engage. And so I suppose my advice would be to make the most of that opportunity to make personal connections. Uh, and that means planning a bit ahead. I think if you can try and plan in the first couple of weeks via email or Skype or whatever it is, a few meetings, uh, an opportunity to give a guest class or a guest lecture or, or whatever might be relevant in your field, then you're off to a good start. And then just being open to throw yourself into it. You know, go along to the Monday lunchtime seminar that's been given by someone, even if it's not quite in your area, put your hand up to help out with a conference that's coming on. Um, because I do think that they're the things that endure over time, those, those personal connections. And certainly I, uh, like Hilton, continue to have some of those engagements that have been just fantastic and I think will continue to be over a long period of time. Okay, yeah, look, I'd, I'd just add to that by saying you do need to be extremely organised. I mean, even though it sounds like a long time, quite a few months, when you get there, it goes very, very quickly. Um, so you need to be organised in the sense of actually getting the application done and getting all the paperwork sorted out, because the paperwork is pretty extensive. That's not Fulbright's fault. That's that's the US visa system, and there's no getting around that. So you do have to have all your documents in order. Uh, that takes a lot of time, so make sure you give yourself enough time to do that. Uh, in my situation, it was made particularly complex because I had a 10-week baby when we jumped on the plane, and obviously you can't get visas and things until a person actually exists. So as soon as he was born, um, you know, we had to take photos, and his, his passport photo is literally 15 minutes old in his passport photo. So yeah, some of those sort of practical things you do need to get sorted out very quickly, but also the longer term planning within the period of, of, your, of your stay there. Otherwise you could get there and spend all that time setting it up and then before you know it, you have to go home. So make sure you have lots of uh, sort of milestones set up ready to go before you get there. I'm going to invite Ruth to come again and hand over to her. So it's, uh, we have questions for anyone interested in any question, please uh, feel free to ask uh, Ruth, of course, or any of, of our alumni, Caroline or Hilton. It's always hard to know because you don't sort of get that feedback. Um, but I'm sort of guessing that the, probably the, the strength of mine was that it was clearly a win-win situation in that I had something to offer but I also was lacking something, which is the, the, the large data set. Whereas uh, the group in the US had the data set but they sort of lacked some of the, the analytical expertise. So I think one thing I tried to make a fairly strong point of the application was that this is really good for us but it's also good for them. Um, and it's a true collaboration. I'm not just sort of going over to steal some of their stuff for my own benefit. They're actually getting some value as well. Yeah. I think there can be a little bit of the, sort of the zeitgeist about it. I think religious freedom, which is something I've worked on for a long time, had been considered sort of irrelevant in Australia, and suddenly at the moment of my application was considered extremely relevant. So that probably helps. Uh, I had a fairly long history of helping to build international and institutional connections uh, through for example, the Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies, which I'd taken a leadership role on, organised a lot of big international conferences and so forth. So I think I could make a plausible case that if I went, it w if, well, I suppose it wouldn't just be about me and I'd write a book, which I did, and you know, that's great, and it got published, and then it's, it's a good book, you should go and buy it. Um, but it would also mean that there would be stronger connections, and I've certainly done that, connected up a lot of my more junior colleagues with 
colleagues in the US, you two should know each other. Could we have a look at your curriculum as we develop this new set of curriculum? So, you know, that, that might have been part of it. But as Hilton says, you don't know uh, what the committee thinks because you're not in the room. If there's no more questions, we might call a close then to this presentation. Um, if you would like a, a, my card, I'm, I'll just go up the back and grab them out of my bag and then you can have a contact uh, for me at the Commission. And as I said, do feel free to uh, give me a call um, when you've had a look at our website. But I'd just like to finish by thanking Pablo for all his work that he's done on getting the slides uh, ready for today's presentation. Our wonderful State Secretary, you'll have to stand up here, Deborah Lee. Fantastic work. We don't know what we'd do without our State Secretaries. Our amazing selection committee members that are here today, our Fulbright ambassadors who are here today supporting us. Thank you all. And thank you all for coming and showing interest in the Fulbright program. <laughs>